we'll refer to that very briefly. It's not part of our writ here today. But uh, some of the speakers referred to that in the discussion about how power, uh, power generation is facing water scarcity from some of those very same supply sources in river basin context. I guess Wadawi was mentioned. I don't know anything about that case, but I'm interested in uh, water for power generation as well, and I'll refer some remarks in that. I'm based in, I'm at the University of Arizona, and I'm in a public policy center, and then my academic link is in the School of Geography and Development, where I have my students and so forth. I'm also leading an initiative that's called AquaSec, which is water security uh, in arid Americas, uh, and that covers uh, parts of US, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Chile, and Argentina. So there's some BRICS links, which I'm also interested in Brazil. I'll refer to some remarks on that. Many of you would have seen uh, these figures, which were uh, done based on satellite remote sensing. Uh, the bottom map here shows the red hot spots. Many of us, uh, of course, know that northwestern India and parts of uh, Pakistan and, and India really are uh, our, our major groundwater pumping uh, areas uh, around the world, other parts in Iran, Deccan, India, and so forth, but also you'll find in the western United States, in Arizona, California, northwest Mexico, and then also parts of southern uh, South America where I'm, I'm also working. So some of the science and policy questions which we're addressing is how does groundwater, uh, is it used in fact as a buffer against variable surface supplies and how does climate change influence the availability of water and surface systems and then what is the implications for, for groundwater. Now we've got a groundwater management issue, we've got groundwater management challenges uh, in many regions and locations around the world. Uh, is this just a question of plan depletion or is it anarchic depletion with no planning whatsoever or are there organizational and institutional responses you know, I'll very briefly remark on Arizona's quasi-administered uh, groundwater use uh, scheme. Uh, if you wanted to have me remark a little bit on Mexico, there's some interesting examples of uh, organizational efforts there. There's an energy water link uh, associated with that, and I'll try to focus my remarks very briefly on that energy water uh, question for Mexico. Just uh, for those of you who think that uh, groundwater is primarily a, a South Asia phenomenon, certainly in, in total, you know, uh, Billions of meters cubed in whatever units you'd like to use. It's very important, but in states like ours in Arizona, dry, arid regions of Western North America, you can see here that groundwater forms about 44% of our state's uh, water budget. And I just sort of put some of those figures up. This is an organi organized form of quasi aquifer, quasi administrative units for managing. Uh, and so they cross, it's a hybrid of basically uh, hydro-institutional forms to, to manage. And it comes from the 1980 Groundwater Management Act. I won't go into all of the details of the act. Of course, there's management plans and so forth, but to sort of give you a sense for some of the things that we're working on. Safe yield, which is the notion that pumping should just be in line with uh, annual recharge, is basically gone out. I mean, these are storage aquifers, and so they should be depleted at some level in conditions of scarcity, but they should be allowed to replenish in times of surplus. This is where we often don't actually make the case because we haven't solved capacity now to pump those aquifers. So even in high uh, recharge years, we continue to pump it at uh, non-sustainable rates. So there's a series of provisions in the, in, in, in the law that uh, establish these and so forth. And again, I won't go into this in too much more detail. But because there's growing pressure from non-agricultural uses of water, particular pressure on groundwater, assured water supply rules have been established for urban growth, industrial, commercial, residential, all the non-agricultural uses now have to meet assured water supply rules to say, you can't just come and do uh, urban development in, in a certain location. Where is the water going to come from? And of course, water is scarce. So water is now starting to limit growth. Water is becoming one of those factors in, in the environment, in that hydro-institutional setup, which are limiting forms of, uh, of, of, of urban growth. Again, I won't go through all of the details, but there are uh, groundwater management and replenishment districts and so forth. A lot of interest uh, when I uh, give talks of this kind in South America as well. You know, if you actually have some surface water and you're talking about using this intraannual storage of the aquifers in some fashion, what sorts of forms of aquifer recharge? And what I'm interested in here is less the permeability and the coefficients of infiltration of the aquifers, which are important, but the design engineers have, have, have done some of those studies. But again, looking at the whole institutional setup associated with how does that water get accessed? How, who actually recharges it? Who claims credit for it in the future? And what are the permitting and siting and, and uh, water quality protection mechanisms? And here are some of the examples. And uh, now let's start transitioning over a little bit because uh, I know my time is probably already going to be up fairly soon. But we've been focusing a lot in in the uh, in, in uh, Mexico. Conagua is basically Mexico's central water commission. It's the national water commission in Mexico. So the same way CWC here functions. 
there's a National Water Commission in Mexico. One of the questions I was going to raise this morning uh, was, well, how do you actually have a center-state relation around water planning where there is some supra-state level, in other words, a central level or a federal level, that tries to take care of interstate disputes and interstate arrangements and not simply say that groundwater or water management planning is entirely a local issue because these are large river basins and these are economic development questions of countries and regions which we're dealing with. So I'm a strong advocate for some role of the central state, of the federal state, how it can be in a more transparent fashion. Some of the questions that were raised this morning, I think, were, uh, were, were quite right. I, I won't really explore that much more. Uh, Arizona is doing these management plans. There's been a whole privatization shift of how water management is being done. The private sector claiming if we meet assured water supply rules, the state can go to hell. We don't need any uh, regulators sitting at the, at the state capitol to regulate our water. We will just follow the law and then that's it. And so in fact, some of those uh, changes have come about. Now, some work that I'm doing is how groundwater energy and also climate and climate change, this question which I posed at the beginning of how potential variable supplies of surface water impact demand for groundwater. I won't go into all of these multiple links. This is a paper that's recently been published in Water Resources Research, if anybody would like to. But sort of aquifer depletion is this cornerstone at the center of this nexus of energy, water, and climate how pumping and climate variability and other things influence in different ways the, the interactions around this nexus. And uh, you know, really trying to specify down at the level of multi-causal links going between each one of the three uh, vertices of this triangle that looks at, uh, at uh, energy, water, and climate. Okay, now to try to shift over to tell the Mexico story for groundwater. So basically what you have here is the solid line is the percent of total national power supply that goes for groundwater pumping. And Mexico, it's very good for us as researchers because there is tariff number 09, which is only for groundwater pumping for agriculture. So it's immediately reported out. And as you can see, back in the 60s, Mexico took about 12% of its power to pump groundwater for agriculture. And now it's down in the current day to about 5%. So that's the overall picture. But of course, the total sector has been growing very dramatically. And so year on year, this is the increases. Now, here's an interesting point, which I'll show. This is when nighttime power tariffs were introduced. So for agricultural farming, farmers can get a preferential tariff if they promise to pump only at night. In fact, it's time of day metering. So they just switch on the meter. I mean, they switch on the pump and the meter detects the daytime and nighttime rates and charges them accordingly. And I can come back a little bit. The thought was that had this not uh, introduced as a nighttime tariff, maybe some of the stabilization of groundwater total demand, because most of these aquifers, and I'll show you some of the statistics, the, the actual spatial mapping of them, are very severely stretched and, 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 and over-exploited. Uh, and so with the increase after the nighttime tariff introduction, it's possible that a power solution for the power company, which would like to offload its peak power, I mean its non-peak power at nighttime at a preferential tariff, may have had a negative impact for, uh, for the groundwater aquifers. We'll come into this. And they're now looking at the actual individual states. And so where Tushar and colleagues and everything, everybody has said, Mesana, North Gujarat is India's groundwater basket case. Well, let me introduce you to Mexico's groundwater basket case, which is the state of Chihuahua. Uh, the dog named after the state, uh, and, and, and so forth. And so what you can see here is <clears throat> many of the large states with consumption, I've done work in Guanajuato, I've done work in Sonora. In fact, I'm living in the adjoining state of Arizona. This is an interesting one because it just continues to take off. And we've done some economic analysis to understand the farmer's response to the pricing regimes. In other words, to calculate basically what are the, the price elasticities of demand for power. And even with the increase, farmers basically have a positive elasticity, which means the more you charge, the more they will pump, which all of a sudden doesn't sort of seem to make sense if you're trying to apply a pricing mechanism as a tool. But what it turns out when you actually go and speak with the farmers, you know, there are a, a whole series of whole scale write-offs of power debt. And so the state is then subsidizing power debt on the part of farmers. So what appears to be an increased pumping response in, in, in response to a, an increase in tariff, of course, doesn't quite work out that way in the conventional microeconomic sense. Um, <clears throat> here's the other thing, and we're very interested in understanding how groundwater pumping in these stressed aquifers of uh, northwestern Mexico, which are the regions which, like Gujarat, have diversified into higher value cropping and are actually using their groundwater depletion for higher value production. But in many cases in northwest Mexico, those markets are outside. And so this is now groundwater depletion based on this energy water nexus that is exporting virtual water. So in the US, as a consumer of imported vegetables from Mexico, I am consuming Mexico's depleted groundwater, or a part of it. Now, how big a part and so forth, it actually was not as big as I thought. We did these numbers and actually came up with the total surface and 
virtual surface and groundwater total amounts of about two cubic kilometers per year. Mexico's total groundwater pumping budget is about 30 uh, cubic kilometers per year, or about, uh, what, one-eighth of, of, of India. And it's a country of about one-eighth the population of, uh, uh, <coughs> of India. It's about two-thirds the size of India, so you can picture this probably extends the length from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, but it's slightly narrower because, uh, so this is, Two million cubic square kilometers, three million square kilometers. It's a, it's a large uh, land map, and they have done for 620 of their aquifers have mapped out all the aquifer units and so forth. And have published budgets, aquifer budgets for 283 of them. The notion being that in this aquifer, if there's availability, concession titles can be granted for new developments, or where concession titles are time bound, the state can withdraw them after a period of time to say no, this aquifer system is overstressed. The sum total of concessions is higher than the sustainable yield. We will start withdrawing the concessions. This is actually the role for uh, a central state function that not that cannot be exercised exclusively at the local level. And, and, and there are some interesting benefits associated with that. So what these two um, figures represent, this is the analysis to say, if annual t increases in this tarifa nueve, this, uh, tariff number nine, which is the agricultural pumping tariff, were allowed to increase year on year over the same period as climate change and urban and agricultural growth demographic, I mean, dem demographic driven changes were allowed to play out at the same time. What would happen at the end of the century in 2100? Which of the aquifers would be depleted, would be the most stressed and so forth? And of course, the ones that are in bright, sort of brown are the ones that will actually be out of water according to the published uh, water um, uh, aquifer uh, studies. And these are the ones with a, a higher degree of exploitation down to the ones which are going to be water surplus. And, and so this is to say, with those elasticities of demand, how will farmers pumping behavior respond to, to prices uh, changes in, in, in tariff regimes? And even with a 2% increase, which would bring agricultural power tariffs approximately in line with the commercial power tariff, in other words, a non-subsidized power tariff, you would still show groundwater depletion in these dark brown aquifers and serious risk in some of the others. But if you allow the tariff to continue at the level that it is today, in other words, not uh, apply a price increase assumed uh, on this basis, then the situation would be all the more drastic. In fact, many more of the aquifers would be under very serious, serious stress. Okay, we tried to actually understand that let's say that concession titles were actually the mechanism by which the state would bring in line some notion of sustainability of groundwater supply and demand for agriculture, urban growth, and so forth. What does it look like the states are actually doing? And it turns out that most of them are pumping beyond the concession titles. So even though the concession titles are there, there isn't a, a strict monitoring and enforcement. And in fact, there's more pumping uh, than, than, than you can find, and, and their distribution by uh, states and so forth. Now, what I'm quite interested in is uh, analyzing this particular piece of legislation that was put in place in 2003 that basically was a nexus, irrigation energy nexus based piece of legislation that basically uh, tried to bring in, I'm sorry, it was put in place in 2002. There were further uh, revisions to the regulation and the nighttime power tariff undid that, uh, uh, I think, quite enlightened attempt to actually bring in place energy legislation that will look at a whole set of rural uh, livelihood and water uh, questions where power demand was tied to uh, groundwater demand and there were uh, mechanisms to, uh, to, to to bring that into to some form of sustainability with a longer term vision for the really the viability of these rural production areas over a, a period of centuries and so forth. I know Mark's looking at his watch already, uh, mm -hmm. so let me wind up uh, very briefly by saying there's a National Water Commission. This is like the Central Water Commission. There is also, but unlike India, there are not state electricity boards. There's a Federal Electricity Board, basically. It's, it's uh, the Federal Electricity Commission. And so these two have different roles in the cabinet. One is a commission, one is a, uh, I mean, one is a federal commission, one is a national commission. There's some asymmetries in the power imbalances when they negotiate. The CFE, because it brings in huge resources through payment of fees and tariffs and so forth, is a much more powerful body than the National Water Commission. And so then you start getting into some differential associated with will you get these two federal level bodies to, or central level bodies start uh, to you know, work together. Um, <clears throat> a little bit on these quotas, as uh, they're called, groundwater um, technical committees, which are formed to basically try to bring some order as you were, uh, as it were. This is the sort of the plan depletion side. If anybody's going to do plan depletion, 
maybe the plan depletion should be done by the farmers themselves. Right? And so this is the idea of trying to get the farmers organized around uh, these groundwater questions. Let me zip through these together in one minute, which is now the flip side of the nexus, which is to try to say, well, what is the actual water requirement for power generation across a whole range of features? And starting with global level assessments associated with power generation by sector, looking at these four sectors, conventional thermal, non-renewable, uh, non-hydro renewable. Hydro is a big one. This is my next big energy water nexus question right here, I think is the hydro power side. Uh, and we're trying to focus in on that. But you know, looking at some of these important countries in terms of size and growth, of course, not just the BRICS, but uh, you know, you have uh, you know U.S., Canada, Saudi Arabia, Mexico is also a, a big player in, in, in some of this. Looking at trajectories over time, some of these key trends associated with where power generation and our power demand as societies and economies are growing globally, and what impact that will have on water resources at the local level to meet uh, to meet generation needs. Uh, and, and there's a lot of interest also in uh, seawater. Cooling. There's a lot of interest in wastewater, effluent, or raw sewage water being used for these purposes. So if we want to preserve fresh groundwater aquifers for drinking purposes and for high-valued agricultural uh, production. Maybe some of the lower quality waters, the saline waters, the wastewaters, and others can be used in the, in, in the power sector. So we're trying to understand some of this. Sorry, I'm just going to go through these very quickly, applying some of the coefficients associated with how much water you actually need to generate the unit of power and then looking at some of these different uh, sort of you know, baselines across the hemisphere. And this reflects a little bit more our focus on these arid Americas countries. And Brazil is an interesting case in point. Again, I won't go through here, other than to say, look at Brazil's hydropower, 85% of today's total power generation in Brazil, which is a huge economy. It's bigger than India's economy. Bigger power generation, and it's 85% from hydro. And now you look over the future, they're starting to diversify out of hydro into other forms, and that, of course, has all kinds of implications associated with water management planning, dams, development, resettlement, all those questions which we heard today. Nuclear is kind of the wild card in all of this. There is a Fukushima effect. In other words, having seen what happened in Japan after the tsunami last year, now what is the planning portfolio on horizons? Europe is going non-nuclear. Other countries are seriously questioning that and so forth. And it turns out that nuclear has the highest per unit of power generation. The water demand is the highest uh, of any of those portfolios. Brazil has some very interesting questions associated with planning and its future and energy water nexus questions. And some of this is lined up. I have a student going to Brazil next year in the summer uh, to work on some of these questions. Mexico, the reverse of Brazil, is the Latin American country with the highest thermal power generation. Of course, water demand is a very key part and is already starting to compete with agriculture for water resources in the countryside, surface water and, and, and groundwater. Um, some of the policy choices, what is the role of renewables, will they actually come in in any significant way, and trying to understand how climate and, and the water energy nexus all come together. I'm sorry, I'm not even giving you a chance probably to even read these things, but uh, here they are. So thank you very much. Here's my email address, and uh, please feel free to visit us on his website if you want more information. There's publications, links, downloads uh, with our partners and so forth. Thank you very much.